colleagues, friends. It's a very exciting moment for us. We have with us a celebrity physicist. When we grew up, and the Trident and I were talking about this just a little while ago, as school kids, uh, our heroes were you know, people like Ken and I. And it was thrilling to read about their work. This was in the mid 60s. And then uh, there, there was a celebrated theory uh, due to Friedman, the method which came out of Einstein's work. And uh, everybody wants to know about where it all began. And did it have a beginning at all? Or was it always there? <laughs> <laughs> and always will be. So, so these are very deep questions. And if there are two or three persons in the world who came closest to answering these questions, Professor Jain Dharayakar is one of them, as all of us know very well. I will not even attempt to mention his awards, whether it is Bhatnagar or the Smith Award or the Adams Award or anything of these things. They come and go. As does the Padma Bhushan, the Padma Vibhushan, Padma Bhushan at a very young age, at a young age of 26, and later Padma Vibhushan as well. So these awards come and go. What is going to stay is what has given, what he has given to the world. A theory of cosmology, which is a very viable theory. No theory is complete. There are questions, and uh, there is this question about reconciliation with the Wilkinson microwave and isotropy and so on and so on. But there are questions with everything. And I'm not saying between you and Professor Nari. I just want to add that I'm here especially on behalf of our director, Professor K. Satyanarana, who has had a very busy week and he was in Delhi earlier this morning and then he has a meeting in Mumbai in the evening. But he came in between just for two hours to meet Professor Narayakar, spent some time with him in the afternoon. And it was very nice and I'm, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of great privilege for me to welcome Professor Narayakar on behalf of our director on, and on behalf of everybody over here, Professor Narayakar. Yes. I will begin by thanking IIT for inviting me for making a talk on this particular topic. And before I come to the talk itself, I want to specify and clarify the way an astronomer looks at things compared to what a physicist will do or what a mathematician will do. So there is this story about three friends who were hiking across England, Scotland, the British Islands. So when one was mathematician, one was a physicist, and one was an astronomer. So when they were on the top of trees, on one side was in England, and the other side was Scotland. And they were coming from the English side. When they reached the top of the region, they looked down, and they saw some animal grazing. So 
uh, astronomer said, looking at that animal, the, road, the, the sheep in Scotland are black. Because it will act for the sheep. So the physicists then said, you astronomers draw conclusions with very little data. <laughs> you are not uh, very clear about what is real and what is speculative. So you have to do a lot of samples from different parts of Scotland. And if you find that they are all black, then you are stating that so the sheep is black. That is correct. And then he turned to his friend, the mathematician, and asked him, asked him, am I not right or do you agree with me? So he said, you are both wrong. <laughs> On the basis of what I see, all I can say is that animal over there is black on the side facing. <laughs> so it depends on what is your discipline under which you are asking a question. How much you are attaching to speculation and how much you are attaching to real facts. So, uh, we will now come with that kind of a uh, analysis of what we are going to do uh, in terms of whatever is available today. So, this question, uh, how well do we know our universe? Uh, this question, if you ask today, uh, you will get a certain answer. And then uh, when we look at it, uh, what happened? Now, the answer that you will get if you ask the people who work in cosmology, which is the science of uh, studying the large scale structure of the universe, the answer you will get is uh, very well. How well do we understand? Very well. This is also the case, by the way, as I will show, that from ancient civilizations to modern times, at any stage, if you ask that particular civilization, how well do you know your universe? They will say very well, because they will tell you a different uh, uh, appreciations of what they are seeing. So here, that's why I'm saying the answer given by most human concepts at all the Okay, so now uh, let's go. Uh, <coughs> we can ask what what did the people think about of the universe when they said they knew it very well, what was it like? So the answer is one was in our Indian subcontinent, the standard answer was Brahman which is the cosmic egg. So here you have an egg which is open and inside is the whole universe and this comes out when you open the egg. And that big egg is called the Brahman and this space in, inside is occupied by the real universe. So all everything is supposed to come out from this egg. Uh, then of course uh, we, we go to some other civilization because ours was not the only one. So the North civilization, Northern Europe, they had uh, the notion of a world tree. That is, it was a gigantic tree which carried on its both on its branches, as you see, as well as on its teeth and you see. Okay. 
for the period of that week, the work trees. That is said to be some gigantic tree carrying on its branches living systems and on its roots also under underground. Everything is loaded on that tree. So this was the notion of North World Tree uh, about uh, the cos cosmic, how well do we understand our universe. So the one can go on if it's very interesting exercise to look at ancient ideas from different civilizations. They don't all match or agree, but each one can claim some kind of originality. So we go on and see if our closer uh, to the earth, what you do, what you have is shown here, you have a uh, snake eating, eating its tail, swallowing its tail. So you have to work out what it will ultimately end up, what it is going inside. But uh, you see that snake is carrying in the daughters, on the daughters are standing elephants, and so on. Then there is a hierarchical thing, one stands on the other. And at the end, on the top, uh, on the top you have the earth. So what you see, what you see therefore, is a kind of hierarchical structure, which was also part of our ancient studies. So we continue. Now all this that I was telling you about was uh, in the very, very old times, it, it's even difficult to say uh, what the exact period was. But we come to close, closer to the present where our information gets more focused. So this is what I am showing you, uh, an, an idea which came from Pythagoreans. Pythagoreans are was a club, club of intellectuals, uh, which were students of Pythagoras. And after Pythagoras died, they carried on his way of thinking. And so there was a, a generation of or two after Pythagoras. And people were uh, used to intellectual discussions. Now, in those Pythagorean uh, things, among the uh, discussion of, among the Pythagoreans, the problem that they were addressing was something more close to our modern times. Because when I showed you the earlier pictures, they were about the universe according to somebody. Maybe some uh, wise man uh, of his time who had the uh, authority to say this is the way the universe is. Now, you don't question that. So, this questioning began to come in the subject, which is the hallmark of science. For science, you can't get away with saying this is the way it is without giving some proof. So this Pythagoreans had a particular theory just to illustrate how people were appreciating now the nature of uh, evidence. So you have here a central fire in the center and the, the earth is going round, going around the central fire and the sun is over here. Right. So the earth is not going around the sun. The earth is not fixed either. The earth is going round, but it is going around the central part. So this was their basic hypothesis. So people began to ask them in the spirit of science, what is it? Uh, where is this central part? We don't see it. Uh, 
They say it is a third priority is here and we are going around. This is the earth. So where is the, the center priority? How do we know you are right? So the Pythagoreans said, after some discussion, they said that this is due the, why you are not seeing it is because there is a counter earth which is also going around the center fire and it's going around at just such a speed as to block your view of the center fire. So you see the point is you, you can't explain the center fire nor the lack of center fire. So what we say is there is a uh, counter earth which is blocking your view. So when he says it is blocking your view, uh, this is uh, a kind of uh, parameter we are introducing in the theory in modern time. Original theory didn't work, so we put an extra parameter. So this is what that extra parameter is the counter earth. So people were silenced for a while. But not for long, because as you can see, they, they could think uh, as well. So they came back and said, okay, we will buy your argument that is the center, uh, there is a counter But then why don't we see the counter That is supposed to go around and it's just next, next to us. So why don't we see the center? So the answer to them was, that was because we are in Greece and it's facing the other. <laughs> <laughs> so we are not seeing the kind of fire. So this theory was surviving because you had to make one or four assumptions to keep it going. And uh, after some time, people said, okay, we are facing the other way, we'll go around and see. What is on it? The 180 degree of it. So they went uh, and they couldn't see any uh, sign of central encounter. Uh, then they said, We, we don't uh, trust your whole theory because there is no proof that is holding up. So what happens in that theory, which is weakly uh, based on facts? is that you run into contradictions. You try to pack them up, then there's more contradictions. Whereas in a good, good theory or a strong theory, if you find a new fact, it fits into your theory very well. You don't have to adjust it. So this is the thing which I, I want you to remember and we go along talking about modern cosmology. So, uh, let's go uh, uh, This is all statement must be tested by and accepted only if checked by observation. And uh, there were three A's in Greece who did a lot for science. And the three A's are Archimedes, Aristotle and Aristotle. Now, who, who were they? Of course, Archimedes you know most because of his various uh, experiments in right in front of you in the earth. Then there was Aristarchus. Aristarchus was very uh, clear about one thing. He said that the earth goes round the sun and it is not the sun going round the earth. So when he said this statement, uh, people who were the majority believers in the earth being fixed at the sun going around the earth, they were skeptical. They said, why should we trust you? Believe me. So Aristarchus said, uh, by way of proof, that if, you, if the earth is going around, then you look at a distant star today, and six months later, when the Earth has gone halfway around, you will find a change in the direction. So it is like as I am sitting here, and you people have a certain angle, only those people have certain different angles. 
So this parallels, as, as we know in modern times. So what they wanted was that to, uh, Arist to, for Aristarchus to tell how much is the change in the direction. So if you have the nearest star somewhere here, you look at it from here and six months later, what is the change in the direction of the star? Relation to background of distant star. So he came, he made some rough estimate. And this is where he was wrong. That means he did not know the dis distance of the stars. He assumed a certain distance and then calculated some ordinary trigonometry. Uh, and they came up with the answer there should be certain such degree, so many degrees of change, direction change. When the uh, measurements were made, they did not find that there was a big change in the direction. Now, first of all, that ruled out Aristarchus' idea when it was correct one later. But why did it show no, no change in the direction? Because the measuring devices were not fine enough to have come in their error bar was much larger than the actual market we were measuring. And therefore they got an answer of no change. And therefore they said that you are wrong. And they believed in the earth being fixed at the sun going around it. Having done this, uh, there was Aristotle, who was the uh, main perpetrator of this false idea that the earth is fixed and everything goes around the earth. Uh, because uh, uh, Aristotle, uh, uh, Aristotle was uh, a very well respected philosopher, scientist, but very lot of motion which turned out to be wrong, but uh, it's interesting to think how we uh, arrived at that and so forth. But all this uh, idea uh, showed that Aristotle was uh, right in, the, in terms of the evidence available at that time, but later on he became As you know, Galileo did a very thorough analysis that showed that Aristotle was wrong. However, we'll come to that later. So this, uh, the three A's from Greece, they had various different influences uh, on us, on the uh, humans. And then we come to this day. Uh, by, by the way, if you go to uh, Aristarchus, Aristarchus' town, Samos, in Greece, you find there is a memorial to Aristarchus. Uh, we said that he was right some <coughs> so many centuries before Copernicus. Because everybody goes around saying Copernicus was the first person to say. So in the years they said this, this man had said the right thing. But he did not get the recognition because of those, in those days the error bar were too large compared to the instruments of weather. So anyway, uh, we come now to the next stage, uh, which is as you, you will see, as you look at the universe, you find perspective is such that a human being, which is, a, which is typically people like us, we felt that we have to have an important role in the world. We are the important people in the whole world. So the, the prejudice was always a universe which was made for man. So we will see now that the Copernicus repeated and started to say that I have just now 
the and the Granger proved that the Earth moves came much later from the observations of aberrations and parallax. So much later than Copernicus said, uh, the whole thing was uh, resolved. Now, how do you know that the Earth goes around the Sun and it is not the Sun going around the Earth? How do you know? This was the question that Galileo was asked by the Inquisition, which was set up by the Pope of that time. Because the Pope and the religious thing was that the earth is fixed and everything goes around the earth. So they, when Galileo started saying the other way, they called him and among various other things, he, they asked him this question. How do you know that the earth is uh, fixed, the uh, earth is going around the sun? So he gave a wrong answer, which nobody knew that the answer was wrong because nobody had understood the physics behind it. So what was his argument? That uh, if you take a glass of water, full of water, and start walking, the water will let and fall down. He said, look at the sun's, uh, the uh, oceans and the large expanses of water, they are having tides up and down. Why do the tides come? Because the earth is uh, moving. <laughs> that earth is unanswered. So that was, the, that was the wrong answer as it turned out. But at that time they did not know it. And the uh, inquisition which was uh, examining that they, do, they also did not know. And they actually did not care because they were more interested in sentencing to Galileo. So they, they were not too worried. Only for the sake of form, they asked this question. Now, what happened subsequently, I should tell you. As, as, as you know, the story was that it ends with Galileo being asked to uh, uh, recap, take back everything, otherwise he would be subject to all kinds of tortures. So he said uh, uh, that he will recap, he recap and say everything I said was wrong. And then it, he is supposed to have muttered to himself, but it moves. <laughs> but he didn't say it loudly. <laughs> So what happened was, uh, recently, that when I said recently, that was in the 1980s, the Pope, Pope of that period, uh, he said that he will have a, uh, a re-examination of all the records of Galileo's inquisition, people documented. So this uh, expert committee, which looked into the uh, old records, they came to the conclusion that what get, evidence Galileo had was not sufficient, but he was right in spirit and has been authenticated subsequently, and, and therefore uh, he should be given pardon. So the, uh, the Pope and the, and the establishment pardoned Galileo so many years later. <laughs> and, but that, that is where the story ends and uh, the actual correct answer to see whether the earth moves or the sun moves was that if you look at the same thing Aristarchus was saying, look at it now and six months later, now your telescopes are and measuring devices are better and you can show that uh, the earth is there is another ex experiment that you can do, and that is aberration. Uh, which, in case you are not familiar with it, you imagine you are uh, in a motor car, uh, which is a press, and there is rain falling on the roof from the top. So the rain falls vertically, as seen by the driver. Now, if he starts driving the car, what happens is the car has a speed and the, uh, the, 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 the 
from a relative motion, you are observing something. So you combine that spirit, that speed. And when you do that, you get an angle. So from that angle, you can work out how much is the speed of the car or the speed of the train. Anyway, so this kind of experiment can be done for uh, stars. So if the Earth is going round this way, and then it is coming round <coughs> six months later in the opposite direction, the relation to the star is it's like the car going this way and the car going this way. So the rain will either fall this way or that way. So similarly the stars will be seen this way or that way. So this is the way astronomers were able to confirm finally that Earth is going around the sun. And now remember this controversy has been going on for so many hundreds of years, but it was the result relatively recently by a, something like 18th century. It is not all that old. So when this happened, the next situation was, uh, uh, where is the sun? So we now uh, start asking, sun uh, is very important, it is our star, a certain Again, you wanted to have a kind of uh, uh, evidence that the, the whole cosmos was for you. So it is the sun which is the center of all stars which form the Akash or the Milky Way. The Milky Way has so many stars. Uh, and where the sun is in relation to them could not be decided until Astronomers could observe a lot of stars. And Herschel, uh, first father William Herschel, and then the son John Herschel, they collected a whole lot of data. And the uh, Herschel uh, senior, he drew, drew this map of galaxies. And in that map, uh, he found that. In the center, that is our sun. So the sun was an important star being in the center of the galaxy. Now having made this statement in the human kind of uh, ego was satisfied. So it is our sun that is like sitting at the center of the Milky Way. But there were some uh, astronomers who were like headed to the establishment that they found something that is not consistent with this whole map. And they started saying this whole map is wrong. And the earth is not at the center of the Milky Way. So uh, how do they do it? So the second emotion was that the sun is two-thirds of the way towards the boundary of the Milky Way. So here is the modern version, relatively modern version of the Milky Way. You find it shining in the center, that is the center of the galaxy. And around it, in spiral form, you find the uh, distribution of stars. And there is dust and other things which is also there, but that doesn't affect us. And the last thing to notice is the yellow arrow like thing. That is where the sun is. So if you look at this whole spiral circle, the interesting part looks to be in the center, and we are somewhere out uh, in the uh, two thirds of the way towards the boundary. So one could say, you know, when you go for looking at with some uh, scenic uh, city that is on, all the important things are in the middle, uh, and uh, the palace or the high uh, or whatever you the important buildings are in the center, and people live in the suburbs further out. So that is what we are doing. So the earth is. Uh, do not 
important and the sun is not important because sun is the one that is taking the earth with it. So that yellow thing is where the sun is supposed to be. So it is not very important. And that led to uh, a so what you want to call the second emotion of the earth. Then uh, the what next? Okay. So the next was, let us see. So the minority view that our galaxy is the only one that we see. See, people in the beginning of 19th century said that all the things that you see in the sky with your best telescope, that shows our galaxy. That is part of our galaxy, nothing other than that. That was meaning that if it is not the sun, it is our galaxy that is important. So again it is our galaxy, we are part of the galaxy, so that galaxy is important. If you said that, then uh, maybe they uh, were faint cloud-like things called nebulae. Where were they? So people used to argue that they are all part of our galaxy. But the majority of you was the other way. You see here, you see the nebulae. Where are, where are they in relation to our galaxy? So you see on the extreme right at the top, there is a circular thing. That is a ring nebula. And uh, at the bottom, there is an uh, explosion type of picture, which is crab nebula. These are very bright nebulae in the galaxy. And on the left, there is Andromeda nebula. Now the argument was that all these are part of our Milky Way. There is nothing beyond. And uh, there were some people who kept saying that they are not part of the Milky Way, they are very much further away. But you are seeing them from a distance, so they look small and faint. So, um, our galaxy is not the only one in the universe. But they were not uh, allowed to argue much for that case. Because this was against uh, the human ego. Again, as the whole thing that we see is part of our galaxy. So let us see, this is to give you an example. Uh, you see here a picture of a lady who wrote uh, interesting books on science, popularizing science, uh, around 19th century, beginning of 19th century. And uh, she had an argument uh, for the following. Somewhere she says in one of her books, the question whether nebulae are external galaxies hardly any longer needs discussion. It has been answered by progress of research. No computer speaker with the whole of the available evidence before him can now, it is safe to say, maintain any single nebula to be a star system of coordinate rank with the ego. This is what this lady, Agnes Clark, was the brain. And she wrote in a very popular book. So she was a good writer. And so whatever she wrote was assumed to be right. And this statement said that there is no evidence at all for the proof that, or the statement that there are distant galaxies which are being seen as bright nebulae, that faint nebulae from here. So uh, she was, uh, so if you had asked any astronomer uh, in the, at the beginning of the 19th century, he would have said we are seeing only the galaxy as, as, as the uh, member of the universe, there is nothing beyond it. So when you come to that, uh, the, there was a third emotion. That means proof 
gamer when the new Dennis Bog had come on the medicine and Dennis Bog was gamer for a night in the dead or 15, somewhere around that. And the details of galaxies would be studied. And finally, it became clear that the sun really are in the galaxy, in the Milky Way, but the majority are beyond it. So what was that like thing you see? Some of them are part of the galaxy. Like the first two I talked about are the ring nebula and crab nebula. But the Andromeda nebula was a galaxy in its own right and its outside. So uh, it turned out that the human emotion took place gradually, as you see, it went through. This ultimately people realize that there are many galaxies. So, uh, at that time, uh, there was the beginning, that means uh, I was talking about 1910 or 15. So, this was the time when Einstein proposed this general theory of relativity. And uh, he said that one should make a model of the universe and see how large it is, what to fix it, and so on. So, in 1970, Albert Einstein applied the general theory of relativity to model the universe. Now, he expected the universe to be static, but could not get such a model. He felt that the universe is a static object and should remain like that. Now, it's very interesting that when Newton began to think of cosmologists. That was when he had done everything that could be done with ordinary stars and so forth. Now he wanted to see whether the law of gravitation can explain cosmology, the whole last case of the field. So what he did was to assume that there are these drops of the can right, very uniform distribution of dots in the space. Now, if you take any particular point and look around in all directions, you find that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. It's the same in all directions. So, you are being pulled by gravity by all stars in all directions. So, if they are equally pulled in all directions, you stay where you are. And so the whole universe is static because of that result. Now he, Newton had done got as far as this. Then he wrote, there is a letter he wrote to a friend of his in which they were discussing this problem. And Newton said that this is wrong and I realized a week later he wrote this second letter was saying what it was, second bite was wrong. He said that if you slightly disturb one thing, the whole balance disappears and it starts shrinking in one direction and not the other. So when this happens, that means that your universe is unstable. If you slightly disturb anything and the system moves away from it, then it's an unstable so Newton was aware of this dynamical law. So he said it cannot be done. So when Einstein started to think, he also found it would be a static answer. So he thought what would give a static answer. So he said that if there is an extra term, this predicted goes against gravity. So gravity attracts, so this extra term is the reverse and his theory showed that it will fit in well if it was proportional to distance. Instead of 1 over r square, it should be proportional to r. So you have got two forces. If inverse square law of Newton and the second law, which he was this uh, lambda times the distance, that particular thing was I think the random or the cosmological constant that I have 
So he got this result and he was happy. Now in the meantime, some people were trying to work out with the lamp pattern and without the lamp pattern the solutions of Einstein's equations. And Friedman was a young man who got solutions which he sent to Einstein for comment. When it showed the universe expanding. So what he did was Einstein uh, did not uh, give him reply to him because Einstein felt anything to the non-static was wrong. It, it has to be static. So if he gets good solutions which are dynamically sound, but they are requiring the universe to expand. And since I don't see the universe expanding, it is obviously wrong, so they just forget about it. So he didn't reply to Friedman. And as ill luck would have it, Friedman died very shortly. And he was around 25 years old, so something terrible. Uh, it was to do with uh, World War and things like that. Anyway, so that happened, uh, and after some time, uh, Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe. So, Edwin Hubble found in 1929. Uh, his famous relation of his proportional to this term. That means to look at the universe with galaxies all around you. So now you know that there are many galaxies, not your own only. You are in the galaxy looking at the others. They are all moving away from you. And you can discover, uh, conclude this from spectroscopy. So, uh, he, this velocity is proportional to distance, is the result of spectroscopic analysis. And uh, as it turned out, uh, I, uh, being a cosmologist, uh, I got uh, one invitation to talk uh, in the institution in Brussels, which is not Brussels, DH, the Institute of Astrophysics in DH. Where Ave Lametra had been uh, was one of the uh, workers many, many years ago. And he was a Jesuit priest who had done his master's degree. So he knew uh, in mathematics. So he knew how to solve Einstein's equations and so on. And he had come to the conclusion that the universe should be expanding, should be non static And that he published in 1927. And in 1929, Hubble published his reviews. Okay, so that when I went to this DH, the people, after I gave my talk on some, some topic, and they asked me to come and look at the window particular window. I said, okay, what is that? So that window was decorated with papers from the uh, paper which Lametra had written in 1927. And all the pages had been and it was red, red marked where he had come to this conclusion that the universe should be expanding with that velocity distance relation. He had derived that of and I said that he, he this the metra should be given the credit for discovering expansion of the universe which Hubble was so now people are realizing that the metra has been uh, also responsible. And uh, if you then forget remember earlier case of Friedman, who had found it in 1924-25. He is the theoretician uh, who solved such expanding universe model, but the others were uh, coming later. So nowadays there is a uh, discussion as to 
Medellín, Abasco, 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 depending on who, who is to be given what credit. But I wanted to show you this particular. So we come now to standard cosmology. 1922, as I said, Friedman predicted the expanding universe. 1929, Hubble found the relation which proved that expanding universe. And uh, here you see the type of spectroscopic evidence that one had. On the right hand side are the spectra of the galaxies. And there are dark lines which are absorption lines that we know. And then, uh, as you go down, you find there is an arrow drawn there, which is underneath. That arrow is longer and longer. That means there is a shift, greater and greater shift towards the red end of the spectrum. And on the left hand side, there are these uh, images of those galaxies and of the space of galaxies. And you find that they get shorter and shorter and fainter and fainter as you come down. From down. Which means we are looking at distant objects as So this is qualitatively telling you what others was saying. We also keep proportional to this question. Now uh, you can do the more exact analysis and calculate it, and you get that particular result. So uh, one could say that this was a good good example of a theory predicting something and observations finding it. Einstein's theory predicted such models and what you find is uh, truly uh, being vindicated by observations of the kind I showed just now. So this is good thing when Einstein learned that without the lambda term you can still understand expansion of the he said this lambda term was an unnecessary baggage to carry. So I don't want, want it. So he said it is better to do without lambda. And he gave up lambda. But then there were others who said that no, keep lambda, just in case you need it, you might just require some parameter to. Uh, expand your theory. So it's better to not let, you can put lambda equal to zero just now, but you don't let it go. <laughs> that was the uh, argument. So uh, here are the different models, I won't go into that. I will come to this. So this uh, is the maker which we talked of the expanding universe. He was a mathematician, as I said, he had studied the mathematics and he was a how to solve and manifest the question. Uh, he, called, he found that the whole universe called, was concentrated at a point uh, and then exploded. So he called that point, uh, he called it primeval atom. An atom which was in the very early stages, primeval. But it was the super atom that the whole universe was in. So that was uh, one example. And Fred Hoyle, who gave the name Big Bang to this idea, he gave a talk, series of talks on astronomy uh, on BBC, and then he introduced this idea, Big Bang. And that name became very common. Although he himself did not believe in Big Bang for So he said Big Bang is the wrong model. But that Big Bang as a name of the model is cut. People felt that we will keep uh, this name. So there was a time in more recent cases, uh, I think it was around uh, 20, 30 years ago, when uh, some one astronomy periodic magazine uh, announced that if you wish to give another name to Big Bang model, 
this suggests that we will run a kind of reader survey and decide it is the best way. So they did this exercise and the answer was Big Bang was the best way. So, so even though Fred had given it because of his disbelief that name stuck and people had, had adopted it. So Fred Hoyer who was alive at that time, he said to me that uh, they should have given me the prize <laughs> because they had announced that the choice which is selected will be given to the prize. <laughs> so this is what happened. So what, what is Big Bang then? It is infinitely dense, infinitely hot state of the universe when it has no well defined space and time. And that was the Big Bang even. And mathematicians call it a singular epoch. Singular means like zero upon infinity or if you go into infinity, you don't know what how to define. And physicists also did not like that, that state because uh, the temperature cannot be defined, pressure can be defined. So what it is? So, uh, and, but at that time, George Gamow who was a nuclear physicist, but interested in astronomy, he came to the, into the picture and he said he would rather not worry about that Big Bang point. But very shortly after the Big Bang, the universe was very hot, so we can work out what the physics of that hot universe was. So he said, let us do this. So in between 1946 46 to 48, George Gamow worked out the following idea that initially, let us suppose there were only neutrons and protons and electrons freely moving, but at some stage they combined to form nuclei. So those nuclei are the chemistry that we do today. All the elements were formed in that early Big Bang effort. So we can work out how to do things with that. So this thing is how the lines that you see, red lines, are the predicted values of elements that will be formed uh, in the early universe, according to Gamma. And Gamma's idea was that all elements are formed. But then it was shown that only a few, which are called light nuclei, that is, and the hydrogen is already there, helium or deuterium, these are formed, and some other few lines. So you can see them marked in that. So we we have here the possibility that different elements were made, provided they were not uh, iron by uh, or uh, bigger elements than uh, something like lithium, lithium, beryllium and more on. After that, you can't make any more in the universe. But it has to be made inside uh, uh, stars. That was a different type of thing. So, George Gamow in his whole enthusiasm uh, he saw that he had a graduate student working with him whose name was uh, <coughs> Alpha, Ralph Alpha. So, Gamma said, uh, I am Gamma and Alpha is Alpha. So, between Alpha and Gamma, there should be beta. <laughs> so, what he said was, he will go and look for a scientist whose name was Beta. <laughs> And he found Hans Becker, <laughs> the THE, uh, as the right, because he had worked on nuclear astrophysics, as uh, not on this problem. And so he put his name in the paper without asking. When <laughs> the paper came out, uh, people started asking him when did you do this work. <laughs> 
So you might say that if I go to the right down, I can repeat the Big Bang. So I should be able to see the Big Bang with my super telescope if I construct one. So he, uh, this is not the case, unfortunately, because if you go further and further down, the universe uh, become optical in it. That means the <coughs> atoms uh, of hydrogen, which are uh, normally uh, transparent to a light going across. Now, instead of that, they, they at very high temperature, the uh, protons and neutrons, electrons, they get separate from the combined hydrogen atom. And therefore, the, the light gets scattered more freely. With, 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 with complete hydrogen atom, it doesn't get scattered. So the result is, uh, you, you will have so much scattering that you cannot actually see anything. Because your ability to focus anything means the light must go straight by. But if the light is scattering, then you don't see. So this is the problem that you cannot do beyond redshift of the function. That means when the, the velocity of the uh, galaxy or whatever is present is about 100,000 times you know, this velocity distance relation that you can go up to a certain distance when the size of the wavelength is reduced to a thousand, one over a thousand of hours. Yes. So, the very early universe means people are nowadays trying to work out what the universe is like, very close to the big gap. So, that is the very early universe. And uh, uh, I, I will take another 10 minutes to finish. So, if you don't mind, and then what happens is that the energy time relationship becomes like this. What you, what I got the formula there, that tells you that the t second is t seconds later than the Big Bang. So, to p in seconds after the Big Bang is given by 2.4 times g to the minus r, g is the number of spin states uh, of the elementary particles present in the universe and t is the temperature uh, to the power minus 2 it's temperature is expressed in the mega electron mode so if you take this formula uh, that tells you uh, that uh, the universe was affected by a sudden such interaction at sudden such time because this is the time temperature relationship. So why could argue that grand unification may have taken place? This is something which uh, particle physicists are interested in. You see the grand unification meaning unification of four fundamental interactions, strong deep gravity and uh, so, yeah, so, so you, you get these interactions uh, together uh, in, at a temperature of 10 to the 16 giga electron volt. So the question is, if you have such a situation, uh, what will be the behavior of the universe like? So uh, astroparticle physics studies this problem. But the problem that uh, the people of Target very often in their enthusiasm is that the astroparticle physics is equal to very high energy particle physics plus very early universe. So these two we are, we are combining to have astroparticle physics. Now you know in CERN this type of circular. Uh, tracks for very high fast particles are produced. Now we go beyond that in astroparticle physics. 
because uh, we want to know when uh, the value uh, unification took place. So if you do this, particle physicist things in the astro, astro particle is a combination between astrophysics and particle physics. So the, when you combine these two, you bring two experts together. What happens? Is that the a particle physicist said, since the Big Bang is established and secure as a theory of cosmology, let me try my speculations of very high energy particle physics in this background. So the particle physicist is aware his, uh, his theory cannot be tested experimentally because that kind of energy is not produced in any man-made experiment. So he said he will take cosmology as the standard for my work. So what does the cosmologist say? Since particle physics physicists know what they are talking about, let me apply their theories to test my speculations of the very unusual. Since I don't know what happened to the big bang, I will ask particle physics. They seem to know the particle physics very well, so they should be able to tell me. So each one trusts the other, but both of them are speculative. This is the, the point. So one would say that the, the, the very early universe is the poor man's high energy accelerator. He doesn't have the money or the capability of inventing. So various other things I won't go into it here, like inflation and various other things so, uh, to be proved. Uh, let me go to one particular issue and finish it. You see, this is what we call the FC cyclic universe. When I show this picture, uh, this standard conventional cosmologists get very upset because this is exposing their weakness. See, what you see is when you ask the present deep time universe, what, what is it based on? So it is based on the FRW is the Friedman Robertson model. These are the Friedman models of the universe. Then you have Omega Lambda. This is the Lambda term Einstein had to extend to work. But you need it now. Now you discover you need it. Then end body simulation. Then you have to simulate how dark bodies interact. Then dark matter. There is a uh, evidence that there is a lot of dark matter in not uh, you don't know what it is made of. Biasing, inflation, these are assumptions and quantum fluctuations to start with. So after Big Bang, there is quantum fluctuation and all these things. The situation is that none except the uh, model, the rest is all what you call speculation. So you are, uh, if you go back to the uh, Pythagorean thing, you start with the uh, earth going around the uh, right object, the, the center object, and you can't see it because there is a thing that we go on putting at the side. So these are the assumptions that you are doing. So, one of them, uh, I, I, this is the one I want to describe. Uh, <coughs> I don't know whether you have heard the story of Emperor's new clothes, the Constitution Anderson's story, and where some crooks uh, cashed in on the desire of the king, the emperor, who always had new clothes different types to wear. So they took, uh, took him uh, for a ride, in a sense. They came there and said, we have 
essentially a good dress of food. But look, uh, you can make out who is holy uh, and who is uh, sin. The people who have committed sin will not be able to see that dress. And people who have committed no sin, they will be able to see. You can make out about your friends who are good and who are bad. So you can bring, bring that dress and wear it. So they said, we'll make it for your size and then after some time they brought it and took the balance amount first. So then they said, we'll put it on you and then you can call the courtiers to see whether they like that and whether they are able to see it for the price. So they he puts something like this. The king doesn't see any dress. But he can't say, he can't see you. <laughs> he can see you. So, uh, it has, the, the courtiers come one after the other. Each one says, no, oh, what a beautiful dress. <laughs> so this happened and towards the end, uh, the group said, now it is time for you to go around the city in a village. <laughs> people can see. see. You can make out who are your good citizens and who are bad. So this was going on when there was a kid that he showed in the picture somewhere. And he asked his mother, because nobody else had this thing to play. He said to his mother, why is the king not waiting any <laughs> But the only honest person. <laughs> yeah. So this this is what is happening uh, in cosmology. My my thinking. Take this dark matter that people are talking about. It is made, supposed to be made of non-baryonic. Baryonic is neutron, proton, or chemists normally use, or physicists normally use. Uh, that is, that, uh, it should be made of, but that doesn't work out. It has, it has to be something else. It can't be that. So if you take this non-baryonic dark matter, everybody who works in cosmology today has to admit that it is non-baryonic dark matter, although nobody has seen it. <laughs> and the argument is, if somebody else says that it is ordinary matter, then the next person is not with it. Is that. So this is a kind of thing that speculations are being given a status which is much more firm than what is required. There should be some speculation in any science just because of progress. Sometimes some speculations are right. Some are wrong. So, for that purpose, I am not against speculations. But it should be limited, and uh, if they are not working out, they should be given up. But rather than if you add further speculations, it becomes a big step. So, I want to end here, and still we are back to Pythagorean times <laughs> with, with this kind of idea. Uh, Thank you very much for your patience. Because of your patience, uh, I thought I could tell you one joke as a reward. You may have heard it, but if you haven't, still you will enjoy it. Uh, I plan on giving a talk. And the talk was very boring. Uh, everybody in the among the crowd was either doing something else or just sleeping or something. At that time, one man got up and took out the remote. So when this was seen by the speaker, the speaker started sh shaking. The whole shoot shows. <laughs> So this man said, no, I am not going to shoot you. I am going to shoot the man who invited you. <laughs> <laughs>
the, it is composed of so many uh, subatomic particles uh, and that also should have come from some energy. Is it like there is a constant amount of energy in the universe that it started with, it started to take shapes of different particles and principles that we have seen? Or is the total energy zero that we see some energy here, there is anti energy? I'm trying to comprehend like where is the first mass came from? Like, is it always there? Is it constant? Well, I think we have to explain to me a little uh, comment in more detail before I can follow it. But one of the problems that particle physicists have to understand or explain is the reason why the Universe is made more of matter rather than antimatter. Antimatter is the uh, reverse of matter as you know. But uh, it's supposed to be symmetric. But then something happened which produced more matter than antimatter. But this has to be understood. Maybe some of the ideas you are talking about also need to be understood. Uh, antimatter means uh, it, it also will have energy or it won't have energy. If both are having positive energy, then it is matter plus antimatter two times. I think we will have to come and explain to me. Now, please. Uh, so, smart questions are uh, how is the. You uh, use that so that others also can get the question. So my question is, uh, how is the uh, origin of dark matter consistent with the Big Bang theory? So we are talking about a Big Bang theory. It started with some infinite temperature, infinite energy, and then it's cooling down something we are having the CMB aspect of 2.7 table right now. And we know about all the moving particles. But uh, dark matter or dark energy, which people are calling, is still not understood yet. So how is it consistent with the theory of dark matter, uh, the, the evidence for it came from uh, observations of uh, what you call galaxy. Our galaxy uh, has got uh, uh, what you call uh, uh, anomalous results at the border. And people have looked at other galaxies and similar in the sense that you have, if you assume all the matter is visible and you are able to take it into consideration, then the amount of gravitational effect would be much larger than at this thing. So all these things have to be properly understood within the law of nature. So one of the problems is to what extent is, is, could this matter be ordinary? But there is nothing wrong with uh, ordinary matter in there. Only if you believe in big bang then you would put a upper limit on how much density that ordinary matter should have. And what your dark matter is doing is telling you that if, if you want to take all of it, as ordinary matter, then you are going to exceed that edge and that will put you in trouble with big bang. So if you are a big bang, then you will go for ordinary, the non-ordinary matter and then the whole world is, whole thing is speculative, because nobody has seen this kind of matter here. That is the question. Is lambda time constant in speculation? Is really theoretically taken? Is it constant? Yeah, lambda. Lambda is the speculation constant or? Okay, lambda term, what has happened in the following that it came and, came and went and came and went. Because first Einstein brought it in, then he threw it away, then it not necessary. Then Eddington and others brought it in because they felt it 
they could make a LFC. Then it went off again. So it went in and out, but finally it has settled on in. Hence, uh, there are distances of supernovae which are measured in cosmology. And those distances cannot be explained properly uh, unless you have lambda term. And this lambda term therefore was brought in to understand the supernovae uh, uh, distances. So uh, if tomorrow you can explain it without lambda term, then they will throw it away. Swamas explanation. Sir? No, it's a Then it's very hard. Swamas? 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 In science fiction only. In science fiction, yes. There is no kind of observational evidence for the world. No. There are theoretical solutions of Einstein's equation where you can have, for example, two points which are connected by two roots and one root may be uh, faster then take it there because that the normal root. So that, that the solution is possible, you get one more than that, that has been used in science. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> In the past, we, theories have been proved and proved. But uh, as of now, there are there's become very. So, in the future, is there any scope to experimentally prove anything? Is, is there any scope to prove any theories in the future? Experiment. I'm sorry, I couldn't yeah. uh, Is there any possibility to prove any theory with experiments? To prove any? Any, any theory. Any theory in some of the proposals. Uh -huh. Is it possible to prove it? So, uh, okay, any theory. Yeah. Uh, is it like a uh, I think the theory has to be mathematically sound, consistent with known physics, and then it can be tested with observation. If these things are not satisfied, then it has to be rejected. Uh, but if uh, through experiment, is it possible to actually prove that this certain theory is right or wrong in the future? Uh, because as of now, uh, there is no equipment that is. Well, I would not know what you exactly mean, but I would say like that if you have a theory to which you had add an extra bit at a your speculation. Then if it explains more than one result, then it is a good addition. But if it does not explain anything but requires you to make further addition of speculation, then it's, it, it should be rejected. But by the way, uh, your wormhole, I know another solution which, uh, and another situation where it is used, without knowing, and that is in uh, Hindi movies. Towards the end, what happens is that there is a hill down around which the uh, person is going down in the And that person is a, uh, is a villain carrying the heroine in the <laughs> and, uh, this person is, uh, the hero is coming down straight. <laughs> so he can reach quicker. Yeah. And he, therefore he catches that. Uh, and then, then the fatty fight happens. So everything goes there. The jeep comes in with the police. <laughs> yeah. I've not seen him anymore. Postulate something. Uh, adding uh, uh, theory, postulates are proved to the right. Postulates of theory proved to the when they are proved to the right. Proved to the right. Then following the solutions, so should, why, why shouldn't they, why shouldn't they, they, they go wrong? 
when Bosnians are told to be right, the beginning of the Christian people and the physical environment and the earth, and they, they show the existence of black holes and everything, like what are the mixture of things. So, and again, we, we want even more. Why are we opting for other evidence, experimental evidence? Thing? Yeah, the positive is right, the mathematics is right. Not equal to this, not even twice. Okay, he says that when the postulate is right, why should we experimentally prove, right? When the postulations in the theory is right, what should we experimentally prove? Oh, yeah, right. When the beginning, the theory beginning with the postulations is right, the solutions can be got the existence of black holes. The solutions are getting like that. Then why are we want again more experimental? These are the solutions. I mean, the anything that is possible, I have to. But I have no comment at this stage. Yeah, I think yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now, I think one of the questions we will have. Question regarding the Hubble zone of this matter. So in that, we uh, say that. Uh, Galaxy, farther the galaxy, faster it moves, uh, faster velocity it moves. So, is, is it possible that uh, some galaxy might be moving with the speed near to the light? If it is farther, that much farther, is it possible that it will be moving with speed uh, near the speed of light? And we could limit the, to its speed because nothing can be faster. Oh, so, it's it's you, are, you are saying whether at some stage. You, you encounter galaxies moving faster than light. Yeah, is it, uh, it is not possible physically, but mathematically, it is uh, in that equation is possible. So, how can you understand it? No, you see, what this law is which I said it is for small velocities. As the velocity increases, it becomes non linear. Mm -hmm. So, you don't run into the problem of anything explicitly near you running faster than light. If you say some galaxy very far away is moving, the problem is the geometry is there and the geometry near you is different. And therefore, the what you call the straight line is, is not a straight line in the real sense. So there is no contradiction, but it's difficult to define it as easily as in the case of no, I think he's smart. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Yeah, give me the chance. You can talk to him later. Yeah, I think this, that's the last question. Yeah. Sir, has speed of light changed over the years? Like a billion years ago, was the speed of the light same as it is today? Or has it changed? Can we ever know that? See, speed of light yeah. is assumed to be constant. And this is an assumption which so far has held up. Now, if anything is different, it should show up through uh, either spectroscopy of very large redshift object, but then we are looking at very long time span, or through some other local laboratory experiments which show inconsistency with some constant velocity of light as a week. So neither of these things have been able to be one. But they come close to announcing something that is exceptional, but not really so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, it is very thrilling for all of us that we are breathing the same air so close to where Professor Arlegar is. It's a very exciting moment for all of us. Uh, you are probably aware that uh, in the 1960s, uh, when Fred Hoyle was looking for some students, he was selected ahead of Stephen Hawking. Oh. And, uh, and as a matter of 
fact, for uh, some time, uh, Stephen Hawking was junior to you for, by a few years, and he also mentored Hawking in some ways and influenced his thinking. Um, Hawking was, of course, um, a very healthy young man at the time. Uh, they played table tennis together. Uh, I have read on the internet that you beat him in a table tennis tournament <laughs> in the finals. <laughs> so, it really has been a great moment for all of us to have Professor Dehna Ali Karavayga. On behalf of our director, let me present a small memento to Professor Nare. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.